That Sober Guy podcast contains adult content, merciless truth, and emotional nudity. Listener discretion is advised. I'm Shane Raymer. You're listening to the best of That Sober Guy podcast, and we help people stay sober. First time listening, want to welcome you. I'm so glad that you're here today. Thank you for tuning in. No goodbyes, just sneak to the we will be back in 2024 with all new episodes and guests, so stay tuned for an awesome new year full of great content. Now, if you're looking to quit or cut back on your drinking through the holidays or as we approach the new year, We have one of the best 30-day alcohol-free challenges out there, and it's helped hundreds of men all over the country quit drinking alcohol. It's called Quit Drinking Dude, the ultimate men's guide to quit drinking alcohol and stay sober for 30 days or more. And in honor of the holiday season this year, we want to give you 25 bucks off when you sign up today. You get 30 podcasts in 30 days, plus daily exercises and a private men's group to keep you connected and hold you accountable. You can sign up today. And use the promo code 25 off. You got to spell it out 25 off at checkout. And you can do that at thatsoberguide.com. You can also find more information as well as other podcasts, other resources, or you can contact us all once again at thatsoberguide.com. And uh, on behalf of the Raymer family, uh, we want to wish you all a very fun, a very happy, uh, and of course, a very sober minded holiday season. And we hope that you enjoy. The best of that sober guy podcast. All right, Rich Beto, thank you, sir, for coming on the podcast today, man. It's good to see you. Uh, how are you today? Good, man. Good to see you too. I'm great. So I, I was a little bit late, man. I was having a, a cat nap with my baby, <laughs> so I was about that. But I'm doing real good, man. Glad to be here. Pumped. Yeah, th- thanks, dude. Now I know, I know how those dad nap goes, man. You said you have a seven month old, so you got to make sure you get those in, and uh, those little power naps are crucial yeah. uh, throughout the day. So, good stuff, man. Well, and thank the Lord, thank the Lord, my stepdaughter um, just woke me up. You have a mate, you have a pops right now. So uh, yeah, it's great <laughs> to have good. the step kids and my baby around. Yeah, because I got a ten year old stepson and a eight year old stepdaughter too. So it's a uh, it's a handful around the house, man. It's a zoo, but I love it, man. It helps yeah. keep me sober. That's for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Me, me too. It's funny. My, my wife and I talk about too, like we, we all kind of had these lives before kids and it's really hard for me to imagine. I mean, trust me, I got some memories. I'm sure you do too. Some good and some bad, but yeah. like the kids, I don't really know what the hell life was about without the kids. You know, do you know what I'm saying? Does that make sense? That's right. Like, yeah. It's yeah. Crazy. Um, yeah, man. It's, it, it's amazing that, uh, just how much everything changes your values your you know it's funny because i haven't toured in a in a couple of years here like before the virus hit i still wasn't on the road so yeah it's definitely you know i'm I'm wondering how that's all going to work in the future with you know you know how i'm going to feel about it going away man it's going to be obviously a lot more difficult than it would have been in the past sure uh so we'll see how it all unfolds you know just i guess the whole taking it day by day that's going to also uh have to do with touring too man we're gonna see if it's you know how that works i really don't know yeah it's got to be tough uh you know leaving leaving your family uh to go out on the road and work you know uh and and speaking of that i I checked out some of the no resolve um music yesterday man super good i saw the never back down uh video yeah yeah great great video dude and even a a a garth brooks cover i mean come on like that's legit right there i know yeah it's funny these guys are, it's interesting. They're trying to do it. It's a different business plan than I've ever done in the past because it was all about selling records. Yeah. And uh, nowadays it's all changed with streaming and stuff. And it's still stuff I'm not really that familiar with. I mean, these guys are educating me on it all. Yeah. But the plan with this band is to release a song and a video every six weeks. Just keep boom, boom, nice. you know, putting them out and to kind of avoid touring for now until it becomes really worth it. You know, it'd be yeah. good to get out there where most new bands will have a song or two out and then they hit the road and they're supporting bands or they're doing small club tours. Um, the hope for this band is we got enough songs out there that are successful. That, I mean, still a club tour, but we can go out there and do a proper tour where we're actually selling tickets or get on like a proper, you know, tour where, where we're supporting somebody. And it's just, 
you know, the guys in this band are all working full-time jobs. I mean, I've been yeah. blessed to be on the road for the last 20 something years and not really have to work a normal job, but these guys all have careers. So they don't want to pick up and leave until it's worth it. So I kind of like that. I kind of like everything about this band. It's much more real and yeah. uh, like a hard work in Detroit band, you know? It's yeah, cool. it, it is, man. And what, one of the things I picked up on just in the videos in, especially the no resolve video too, there, there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of energy and a lot of passion that's coming out and you can see it in that. Uh, I, and you can, yeah. you can see it, you can feel it. Uh, obviously you can hear it. Uh, so I, I know what you're saying when you say it's, it's real and that's probably a good, a uh, good thing to be a part of as you're kind of growing and, uh, as this, you know, whatever touring looks like coming up, it's probably exciting. It's exciting man. you know, for me doing it sober will be a first. Yeah. Um, so I'm also glad I've had all this time off to really establish you know, myself in recovery. And I didn't just, because I tried to do it a few years ago. Um, I was out with Papa Roach and during that tour, I was when I was taking Oxycontin. Mm -hmm. So I withdrew from that during the tour and it was just so memorably horrible, man. You know, having that withdrawal symptoms and you've got to go on stage for thousands of people. So that was my last experience um, sort of, using drugs and stuff on the road and where I had to come off of them. So now that I'm completely sober and straight and healthy, um, I'm really looking forward to it because I've met so many people now, you know, musicians and and other people in the industry like yourself that, um, that are in recovery, man. And I had no idea before that it's such a huge community of people. And and the best part about this community is everybody supporting each other. So had I have known this years ago, it probably would have, you know, maybe taking less time to, to make this step into a, a life of recovery. But, you know, there's meetings and stuff at, at backstage now at big festivals. I found out you can like, you know, look for meetings and stuff of, you know, uh, recovery programs and stuff. Yeah. It's you just have to kind of look and be, you know, be in it, I guess, to, to know where to look. But yeah. so it's exciting, man. It's really exciting to get out there and actually be very really clear headed and probably at my best, I would assume playing, you know, in this situation, because with finger 11, it was, uh, I mean, we were just major, major drinkers. And, you know, I was in my twenties and thirties. You don't, I don't know if I knew I was an alcoholic in the beginning because it was just so everyone around me was drinking like that. And it was so, you know, pushed down your throat basically and encouraged every day. And it wasn't until I started going home um, for more periods of time that I realized, man, you know, I can't stop, you know, and it actually got worse at home. So doing it straight and sober is a, it's a little nerve wracking. And I, but I, you know, that's why I got support of you, you know, like brothers and uh, people, you know, in these programs that are there for me, but it will be a big change, you know, but one that I think will be a positive one. Yeah, to- totally, man. And and I, I imagine that, you know, being a musician, being an artist, and we've talked about this on the podcast in different different times, um, sometimes it can be hard to transition, um, you know, that, you know, your your passion, your skills, like what you're good at playing drums. Um, and you've done it so long intoxicated that that transition into sober can be a little bit different. You know, was that a tough transition for you? Like in the beginning or, or was it pretty easy? Well, it's funny. Well, a few things. I mean, I, in the beginning of playing, I used to have a rule never to, to get drunk before going on stage. But as time went on, you know, it became, you know, one monster Red Bull or sorry, monster vodka and a monster Red Bull, (laughs) you know, another Red Bull vodka, maybe a beer, maybe a shot. And I don't know if I ever went on wasted, but it, as time went on, I was always, you know, getting more and more lubricated before I I would get on stage. And when I, you know, kind of got sober and I wasn't on the road just here at home, I went through a period um, where I just kind of was unsure if I would be able to play. And I'd lost all my passion for a little while. You know, we can get into it a bit, but I was fired from my last band, St. Nasonia. So that was sort of a big thing for me. I didn't hit rock bottom until, you know, about a year or two after that. But when I did stop everything, um, there was definitely a time where I wasn't sure if I was going to play again. I was very scared because there was like literally no um, creativity flowing through me. I did not have that, um, just any inspiration to play at all. But 
I think like anything that you love, you got to give this stuff some time to get your, mm. your mind and body back. And, you know, thankfully in time, all of a sudden, you know, uh, here I am playing, practicing all the time and it's all come back, you know, as, as well as so many other things in my brain, yeah. you know, it's all come back to me. Do you find it like fun? Just super simple. I mean, it's like fun again. You know what I mean? I know for me, like one of the greatest things that's been about being sober is finding like that, like that kid like spirit that was suppressed once I got into my early, you know, uh, or late teens, twenties. And then you just suppress all that shit and then you get sober and you're like, man, dude, like I can find, I mean, not that every day is great, but like it is at the same time and, and you're free and you're having Absolutely. fun. Like, it seems like you're having fun. Like even when I watch the videos, like you're smashing on the drums, dude. And you're like, lit I can see the fun in your eyes, bro. It's pretty sweet. Yeah. It, well, it got to a point, especially when you're touring so much that you don't really practice anymore. You go out on the road, you do your show, you're not practicing during the day on the bus. Yeah. And then when I got home, all it was, was a party. So mm. having this time off, it was like I was saying, it's been nice to just go to my drum room and just, yeah, put on the DC record, yeah. Metallica record, or I love drumming to Michael Jackson, actually. Those are the <laughs> oh, best nice. groups, you know, but yeah. yeah, just putting it on and uh, having fun again, like you said, like a 15 year old would. Yeah. And that's kind of what it is all about. It got to a point there, obviously doing it on a professional manner where it was about just making money, Business. you know, just having that whole illusion of the rock star guy, which has completely changed in my mind now, thank the Lord, because that was part of the problem with, you know, living that lifestyle was the person that I thought I was or yeah. that I thought I had to be. The, yeah. And it's really an illusion, you know? So, um, yeah, getting all this stuff back and in a childlike way is it's amazing because I thought it was kind of gone. You know, I wasn't yeah. sure if it was ever going to come back and it's come back tenfold in much more of a pure way you know what i'm saying yeah yeah absolutely man it's so good to hear um what yeah. was if you don't mind sharing a bit um just to kind of take us back and then and then maybe we'll jump into um you know more of what it's like today um what yeah. what was like a normal a normal day like i mean obviously you're out on the road quite a bit um what did uh yeah. what did one of those days look like when you were kind of just really struggling well, um, with St. Asonia, I was, I was drinking like I always was drinking, but at that point I had moved past, um, Oxycontin to meth. Mm. So my usual day with this band, everything was a secret with them. So I was staying awake for days and days. I was, one of the first things I noticed with them is I would sleep with my clothes on every night on the bus. For me, looking back, I can really tell how how uncomfortable I was in that environment. Cause wow. in the past, I mean, I just be in my underwear sleeping. It was like home, yeah. but uh, it got to the point where I was just basically waiting until the bus rolled up to the next hotel. So I can get out and go to my hotel in privacy and do more drugs. So it was waiting around uh, either on the bus or at a hotel and always sneaking away and using always. Mm -hmm. And then as it got later in the day, starting to drink, but um my behavior changed pretty erratically um, because like with that drug, it, it's a very sexualized drug too. Um, unfortunately, it's kind of like I became, it's, it's shameful. Some of the perverted shit I was doing, but yeah. it, you know, I was, it was nice to know later on that that kind of just comes hand in hand with <laughs> methamphetamine. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but it all became a, you know, the whole day was basically about trying to find someone to hook up with mm. uh, and sneaking away and doing drugs, you know, but, the example I always give sort of my lowest of my low on tour was um, just to kind of show you where I was at mentally. I went over to Europe with to support Motley Crue on their final tour ever. And, you know, I know they're coming back now, but at yeah. the time we thought it was ever. <laughs> <I> remember, <yeah. laughs> but, you know, there's a band that I've grown up loving and idolizing my whole life. And we get a chance, you know, also to go to Europe, which is, you know, a pretty amazing to go over there and yeah. tour and to be supporting Motley Crue on their final tour. Um, the first day I flew over there, I brought drugs with me. I drank all afternoon. Um, and basically we went on stage and played. It was like a 30 minute set. And I think before my drums were e even off the stage, I had gone down into the basement of uh, Wembley Arena in London. I had found a little bathroom to sit and smoke my drugs and you know watch my porn and basically in the background all i hear is like dr feelgood or shout of the devil oh, and that's the band that i have grown up loving and it's the first day of the 
of the tour and I don't even give a shit. I'm not watching them. So when I look back on that, like, oh my God, man, that really shows where my brain was at. That was, that was the priority. You know, I flew yeah. all the way over there and here I was in a bathroom in the basement of arena by myself doing drugs and, and watching wow. pornography. And it was, you know, just a complete, degenerate lifestyle at that point. And that was the whole, I don't think I watched a whole Motley Crue show that whole tour, Really, which is crazy to me now, you know, and of course their regrets and you got to move on, but <laughs> that one still bothers me. You know, <laughs> I guess it's nice to know with yeah. any band in the world, Motley Crue definitely have been there themselves. So, you know, I'm sure if I had a chance to explain, they definitely all be like, Oh yeah, dude, we understand. <laughs> yeah, Trust me. We understand. <laughs> oh yeah. man. Yeah. That's so that's, yeah. Uh, he, yeah no it, it's it got crazy. bad man that that was my day basically it became nothing to do with the show anymore the show if anything was just something in the way or just a way to sort of m maybe get into that environment and meet a girl or something but yeah and my playing just really declined because i was staying awake for days and days and you know and that that's what led to my dismissal from the band and i mean at the time i thought they, it was all everybody's fault. You know, they, wow. they screwed me over all this stuff. You know, I didn't deserve this. And um, man, of course, now it's like, what a blessing that was. Cause I definitely would have probably, well, definitely would have died. Not probably for sure. I wouldn't be here right now if that hadn't happened. Yeah. Um, and now, you know, a few years later, I'm friends with those guys. Again, we're talking that you know, they were very happy to hear that I got help. Um, another guy in the band, you know, had to get some help himself and he did. So, you know, as hard as it was to take it at the time and it took, it made me kind of go even further into the dark side. Um, it, I don't think I could have got sober without that happening. You know, yeah. like staying on the road and living that life was, I needed that to stop for a while in order to figure this shit out, man, because that kind of lifestyle and dealing with this aren't, do not go hand in hand. Yeah. You know, you need some time away. I went to rehab, of course, and all that stuff. I got, I had to get away from the rock and roll life to figure out my real life, which is my home life. And this guy, you know, cause Rich Beto, the drummer is what I used to think I was, but I'm not, man. I'm Rich Beto, the father, the husband, mm -hmm. the, the brother, the sister, the son. And I went through a period where I was just, no, man, I'm Rich Beto, the drummer of Finger 11, a drummer of Santa Sonia. And God, the ego involved in just thinking that about yourself, yeah. but it just happens after 20 years of playing, you need a reality check. So sobriety has brought me, I think made me more humble, you know, about the whole idea. I mean, I, now it's such a blessing to be able to do that for a living and I'm so grateful for it. But um, yeah, when you're right in the thick of it, you just, you get caught up yeah. in the, in the silliness of it all, man. So it's, it's been a blessing to, to get sober and, you know, to still be here to talk about wanting to make music into the future, you know? Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's crazy. Like the perspective that we get on things too. Um, you know, you take something like all this crazy shit that's happened last year. It's really changed the way a lot of businesses, um, are, are operating or some of them aren't operating anymore, but right. uh, the music yeah. business, um, comedy business, show business in general, just everything has changed. And it's really easy to look at the negative stuff in our lives that have changed, whether it's work or things that uh, have just kind of happened or are not happening, right. but there's always something good that comes out of it. If we can stay on that uh, kind of gra practicing gratitude, I guess. And like you're saying, like, man, yeah. I, I was touring, I was doing, um, you know, living my life, this, you know, lifestyle, but like I needed to, um, you know, to not be in the band anymore. I needed a break. I need, so that was like a, a reset for you. Um, which is cool when you can yeah. actually become sober and look back and, and go, man, yeah, that's, it worked out just how it was supposed to, you know, like, for sure, um, man. yeah. One, um, one, one thing, uh, I wanted to ask you too. Um, so when, oh shit, I totally lost my train of thought right there. Oh, that's so weird, bro. It's like the weirdest thing. Like well, I think brain. I jumped all over the place in that answer, so I probably No, it wasn't that. <laughs> I had I actually had a question. Um damn, dude, totally just slipped my brain. Well, well case, one thing hopefully... I was gonna say on yeah, that yeah, go subject ahead. quickly is um uh the idea of like I was talking about my um identity as being Rich Beto, the drummer mm. from this band. It went through a point uh in my life where I couldn't, 
I didn't want to be anybody else. I needed that thing first and then all the other stuff. And I thought if I didn't have that, I, I was no longer the guy that I wanted to be. Um, I really love the idea now that you can be, um, you know, since I lost that identity, it's, it's made me, I think, uh, it's going to make me a better musician into the future because I think that bullshit of being a rock star stuff, it, you know, it comes across where, when you're on stage or when you're meeting people at meet and greets. I mean, I don't want to call out any of my old bandmates cause that's not my, um, in my nature to do anymore, but the way that I handled myself and I uh, handled myself in that band in finger 11, there were things that I just, it, it just didn't seem like, you know, normal behavior. It, it didn't seem like when you meet people, like that's how you're supposed to kind of do it. And whatever that might mean, it's, yeah. I guess it's, I don't want to be calling anyone out, but it's, I think being me, this identity is me of a person. It makes the, you know, the, whatever the rock star version of me better than trying yeah. to turn that around and trying to be Makes the, sense. the guy in the band. And then, and then the father and all that stuff. It's like sobriety, man. Like if that has to be first, if, if that ain't first, your career and your family and stuff are all going to suffer. If I'm trying to be the guy in the band as my very first thing and try to be, you know, all in and, the best crazy drummer I can be. And then, oh, okay. But when I come home, I'm, I'd hardly talk to my mom and dad. Yeah. Or when I come home, all this shit, man, I think that has to come first. And if it does, it makes you such a better musician. And, um, and these days, you know, with this pandemic going on, I mean, all these bands were doing like um, live stream events and getting really hands on with their fans, um, yeah. you know, doing virtual songwriting stuff. I know Clint from seven dust was doing like a, online songwriting sessions those things uh i think are really awesome and humbling for bands to get back to doing like really having interaction with the fans i'm not sure in the past in a, at least in finger 11 if i would have been interested in getting that close with people yeah so again it's finding the blessings in all of this you know last year's pandemic is it's destroyed so many you know restaurants and really and so many careers of people in my in my experience, I had a baby. I, I joined a new band. I really properly got sober. I mean, it, what, everything being taken away from me last year has been just like with the band getting fired from it. It's all kind of needed to happen. And obviously all, you know, I think about, I know people have lost their lives in this horribleness of this uh, virus, but my personal experience is you know, selfishly being a positive one, you know, <laughs> besides being stuck at home, I get to say I was stuck at home, but with my new baby. Yeah. So, you know, I feel for everyone that's gone through all the hardships, but it, it, it's like, it was all part of the path for me, you know, like th yeah. to have this happen. And, but yeah, what? I kind of went off what? track. No, there, that, that was, no, that's, that's, <laughs> it was perfect, bro. And, um, I was, uh, I, it was you actually kind of hit on what I had forgot earlier. And I was going to mention something about the true cool. self. Like you found your true self. Like that's what I feel like that is. It's like, you're, you're not identifying through this person that you think you need to be or should be or live up to, or trying like, I always struggled with, I felt like I had to like prove, prove stuff to people. Like I, I'm good. You know, I can do this or I will do that. And then at one point, like one of the best things is I love just when someone asked me something, I just go, I don't know. <laughs> I don't have right. to have the answers. I don't know. Like I, I have That's no clue. Right. Like it's so like relieving though. Um, but what, so what was it for you that, um, like, what was that? Did you have that moment where, and I get this question a lot, like, how did you know, you know, um, or, or what was that like when you finally decided like, I'm, I'm going for this, I'm going in like, this isn't the life I want to live. I need to get sober. I don't want to die. What, you know, whatever the case, what did that look like for you? And unfortunately for me, it had to involve um, all the worst stuff. I moved down to Michigan from Toronto. Um, the band thing happened, me getting fired while I was still going back and forth. So I moved down here to Michigan. I was out of the band. Um, it was my girlfriend at the time, now my wife. And the drugs had stopped only because I didn't know where to get them here in Michigan. So it was just, mm. it, luckily with methamphetamine, it's not the kind of addictiveness where it's like, physical addictive addictiveness it's more just mental yeah. so i was able to get off drugs just by you know because i wasn't around them but yeah. i was drinking even more at that point because i was still missing something i was used to in my system but 
my girlfriend, now wife at the times, really noticed that, you know, I was blacking out. We were fighting like crazy um, where I was like destroying my guitar and wrecking my V drums, just over the top anger stuff. And it came to a head one night where uh, the cops were called. We, we had a fight and, you know, I kind of pushed her down the ground and not kind of, I did push her down on the ground and the cops came and they handcuffed me and they took me away to jail as they should have. Um, so I was sitting in jail and, it, you know, just outside of Detroit here there, you know, the jail was just, it was intimidating being in there, you know, that everyone was talking about, you know, more having guns, being caught with guns and everything. And I'm just this Canadian guy, like, holy <laughs> fuck, like, yeah, wow, I've, this is where I've gotten, man, I've got fired yeah. from my band. I'm sitting here in jail now. Um, and I'm going to have this now on my record, like a domestic involved with like putting my hands on a woman, someone that I love. Like that was really, I was getting really close to rock bottom, but I hadn't got there yet. Yeah. Um, when I got out of jail, I was obviously on, I was only in there for a couple of days and I was on probation, but obviously part of that probation was no alcohol or drugs. And it was very quickly after that, I, I started drinking heavily, blacking out and, my wife was scared for my life. She was, you know, she thought she could see that this whole arrest and stuff had brought me even darker. And um, she made the right move and called my probation officer, um, which at the time I was so furious about and felt so betrayed. But now again, in hindsight, she was, she didn't know what else to do. Yeah. And she was trying to save me. But from that first probation call, then I was, had to do the like P tests every few days. And it was, they, you don't know when they were going to call. Um, so I failed that you know, immediately. Then I got a bracelet put on my ankle, um, failed that immediately. I mean, I could not stop drinking until the judge um, was like, man, you're going to go for six months or something oh, to jail wow. it, or you can go to rehab. And what a, what a great man he was to do that. I mean, I had five probation violations, how yeah. he did this to me. Um, but it was me going to rehab and getting there and actually deciding, you know what, I'm here. I'm going to just, figure out if I do have this disease of alcoholism and I'm going to just give this a real go. And it was only a day or two into it. Um, it was a great um, rehab center that I start educated on this behavior of mine and how it's real and how this is, you know, I started tracing back my family and my, you know, how I grew up and how this stuff has affected me and the, my desire to do it, how different it was from most people. And, it, you know, it was there. I kind of surrendered to, holy shit, man, look at me. I'm in a freaking rehab. Yeah. I'm, and then everyone else's stories were so much like mine. Yeah. Um, so it was really getting to rehab and, and opening my mind to, I might have a problem. And I, you know, luckily very quickly realized, okay, I am one of these people. <laughs> um, the second yeah. big thing. Yeah. <laughs> the second I'm big thing. Like was them. <laughs> yeah. That's like I'm that class. Like oh, yeah. I'm not like them. Yeah classic line right. of course but it was spirituality too i mean i hadn't ever i used to consider myself an atheist mm. and uh but the one thing i always found about atheists was how i always thought they were very rude in how they judged other people and you know the example i always use is ricky gervais he's such an amazing comedian or um you know bbc shows are so yeah. genius and the, some of the best ever done but when it came to him doing interviews he often talks about um god and stuff and you know he's there doing a, a promo for the office or something and he's telling it people in the interview how people that believe in god are stupid and stuff that's how i took it even when yeah. i believed in his beliefs um so i just thought man i'm gonna try getting on my knees and i'm gonna i'm here at this rehab place i'm gonna just take these take this advice and it was pretty immediate man as soon as i did the act of getting on my knees and trying to have a conversation with something that I didn't know what that thing yeah. was, you know, who I was talking to, who was listening. I just did it. And I think the act of just doing it opened my mind to uh, the spirituality path that I needed to get sober. So all of these things, man, were hitting rock bottom, but really what, once I got to that rehab center is when I, I'd say it was rock bottom. Um, yeah. But yeah, you know, that's when God kind of came into my life. And that's when the reality of my situation, I finally accepted it, surrendered. And that was sort of the moment, you know, it was upwards yeah. after that, man. Yeah, I was. It's funny. As soon as you said surrender, I swear to God that lit, it was literally on the tip of my tongue, too, because I could picture it just getting down on your knees and going like, 
I don't, even if like some, somebody doesn't have any clue what God is or a higher power or what, whatever, just saying, I am done. I'm beaten down. I'm exhausted. Like I surrender to you when we become available and we make ourselves available to something higher, there's something that that does, um, internally, at least it did to me. It sounds like it did to you too. Um, that can, that can put us on a, on a different path, a different path than, than we're going down. Uh, yeah, that's, that's really cool, man. I love it. I, I always liken it to, you know, in the military that, you know, get up first thing in the morning, you make your bed. And there's a yeah. reason you do that. I've never been in the military, but so I'm told, you know, it sets, it's the first goal of the day done. Yep. Um, it puts your mind in a, in a particular place for the day. You know, now you're achieving things, you're getting things done before you even step, you know, a few steps away from your bed, you're doing something. And man, do I ever understand that now the, the mentality of to do that. Um, I can't say I always make my bed in the morning, but I, I get why. <laughs> yeah. But for me, it's about first thing in the morning, getting on your knees and praying. You know, I don't need to know anything more. I, you know, cause I still question, you know, God and what that is to me, yeah. but I don't need to know. It's great that it's a mystery. You know, mm-hmm. it's the, the universe is a mystery. It's the act of me getting on my knees and just putting my brain, like you were just kind of saying there, it's setting your day in the right direction where, yeah you know, as soon as I do that, I feel better, like so much better. I'm ready to start my day. And I used to really um, spend my time thinking, oh, man, you know, I'm, it's, it's so foolish. There's nobody listening and all that stuff. I don't know if it's true. I don't know anything, man. I'm yeah. just this, you know, dumb ape like human you know, homo <laughs> sapien guy walking on this planet. I don't know yeah. anything. Who am I? All I do know is that when I do this act every day, it's, it's helped me stay sober. It's helped yeah. me better, be a better person, a better father. And it's making me make better decisions. So, yeah. Um, well, I, I so understand now why prayer is part of this whole recovery thing for it, me, at least. It, and it helps find some peace throughout the day. Like, yeah, because my, yeah. a lot of us who struggle with addiction, like our minds, they don't stop. I know my mind just doesn't stop if I'm not, um, you know, actively working on it, you know, so like just yeah, being yeah. in being not in control and back to even what I was saying earlier, you just hit on it again. Like, just, I, I don't know, like, I don't have to have all the answers. I just need to do yeah. the next right thing and kind of stay in the moment and, uh, practicing that makes it, makes it definitely, uh, easier. Um, one thing I wanted to ask you, like how, how have your relationships improved, man? Just from um, on, on a business tip, on a, a marriage tip, just relationships in general. Uh, man, I I feel like it's tenfold, like a hundred percent. The way that I really know that's true is from feedback I get back. I mean, especially, I mean, my mom and dad and brother and sister are in Canada and Toronto, so it's really great the positive things they have to say when when I talk to them now, they, you know, that whole, they can see a sparkle in my eye again. You know, I yeah. feel like I'm listening. I'm not just waiting to say something. I'm actually listening. And, uh, and I do everything in my power to only give positive feedback back to them. You know, me and my sister, for example, we're so close in age and we're just, it's so natural for us to, to call each other out on something and just sort of have an opinion about each other's lives. Yeah. And she just went into a new business venture recently that I'm, a little unsure that she should be doing. And as she was telling me about it on the phone, all these um, lessons that I'm learning in the, in this program came into my mind. And all I did to her was just, just give her tons and tons of positivities. Be like, that's awesome. You know, her name's Justine. That's awesome, Justine. And you know, I'm here, anything you need, man, I just want to help you and support you. I'm so proud of you. And I never would have done that in the past, you know? Um, And then of course my family life with my wife, I, I think it's, I mean, again, she would probably be the better one to ask, but I, I think I'm so much calmer as far as reacting to things. Um, I, it just, everything that you learn in the, in these programs, I feel like I utilize in my life daily. At least I try to, um, in the past, I would just say things and make decisions, uh, on the whim. But now most of the time I stop and I just think about, you know, okay, calm down, think about what you're going to say. How could this affect the situation or how could this make it worse? Or sometimes just don't say anything, just listen. Yeah. Um, so I, I'm using all these things all throughout my day, man, every day, how I'm disciplining my stepkids, how I'm 
just everything, man. Yeah. Throughout today, everything I'm doing is is focused on the things I've learned and trying to do it in a positive way and not anything yeah. negative. I'm just trying to put out positive stuff in the universe. And I've noticed it so much come back to me, especially musically, man. Since I started doing that, all, all of a sudden, all these opportunities have, you know, jumped into my life again. And before, I, I thought if I didn't do music again, sober or not, that was that's my career. What am I going to do if I can't do that? Things in the, the, the things, the steps in these programs that have taught me that no matter what happens now, I mean, I really hope to be get out there touring and to be successful still as a musician, but uh, I don't need that in my life anymore. As far, if it doesn't happen, I'm going to be okay. Yeah. You know, I'd like that to happen, but tomorrow is a mystery, man. So I, you know, as long as I just take care of things today, yeah. um, who knows? It's, it's, it's a wonderful thing, but I don't know. Maybe I, I'll never tour again. Maybe I'll never, you know, it's, but if I don't, then that's because it's meant to be that way. Yeah, um, that's good. But since I've sort of got, got there in my head, all of a sudden the, the music stuff has come back tenfold in my life, you know? Yeah. So I had to sort of let it go and just put it into God's hands for it all of a sudden to appear like never before, which is still yeah. blows my mind, man, how that works. But dude, yeah, so yeah. It's no, it, it is a crazy cause it's so un, it, it does, it's uh, I don't think unconventional is the right word. There's another word I'm looking for. It doesn't, it doesn't make sense all the time, I guess is an easy way to put it. Right. We think we need to push and push yeah. and work harder and do more. And my sponsor and I talk about this a lot. He's like, man, you just, you got to just go, you got to go with the flow. You got to have peace in the unknown. You know, you have to be able to sit in the moment right. and completely trust. And it's a really hard thing to do. And I wish, like you said, so yeah. many good things like w regarding the program and just living life too. I wish that like when, so when I talk to somebody who's new or who's looking to get sober, like we're so center focused on the addiction, on the alcohol or the drug or whatever. And I'm not downplaying that. Like it's definitely, you know, there's issues there. Like I have an issue with drugs and alcohol and number one, alcohol. Um, but right. there's so much more to it than that, especially in a program. We're not, yeah, we're, we're learning how to not use those tools to, to, uh, deal with life. We're learning how to right. live life, like on life's terms. And that's a lot of the stuff that you're talking about. And I, yeah. you know, we could save people so much time if they could just get a little nugget of that and just go, okay, wait, <laughs> there's more to this than just not drinking. Like we, we can learn yeah. how to live life and be peace, you know, have some peace and all that, all that stuff that comes with it. Yeah, man. I, I love the, the words, uh, peace, peace in the uh, peace of the unknown. I think I got to have peace. Um, yeah. Would you say I had something like that? You got to have peace with the unknown. I love that, man. That's, that sums it up so perfectly. You know, you can't, you can't know what's going to happen tomorrow. So why yeah. stress and panic about it? Cause it's coming um, all, but you can't affect it today yep. by how you're living today. I think, Absolutely. but uh, that was all I did in the, in the past was worry about the future and um, ponder upon my past. That's all I did, man. Um, and I was never present, you know? Yeah. Uh, so, so that's such a big thing in my life now, just to be here now talking to you, my attention is with you. We're talking yeah. and it's, it's funny, just little things like that. It's strange to think I never did that before, but, uh, it affects everything, man. You know, mm. now me and you the other day, we're, you know, doing some calls together. Now here we are in a meeting <laughs> uh, at a podcast today. Now we're friends. I mean, everything just happens so beautifully when you just do it in the moment and just yep. take it day by day and, you know, real things come your way and you appreciate them then. It's oh yeah, it's so so cool, man. And it's it's there's excitement there too. Okay, man, like uh, man, what's God got today? You know, what's gonna happen today? You know, and so, sometimes you know yes. some days are better than others. But I can honestly, genuinely sure. say that, man, my days sober are just so much more fruitful. And um, like I am pretty dang excited most days to wake up and like see what's yeah. going down. You know, I, I want to put, we just, we got a couple minutes, but, um, and, and we'll have to do this yeah. again, man. I really appreciate you taking the time to come on and share, man. Just be so open about everything too, yeah. dude. Thank you. Absolutely. Um, brother. Yeah. One of the things that I love that you said that, um, it has been pretty personal to me is when you're talking about like speaking into people, like speaking into your sister, for instance, like you're the, the, right. the program being sober allows you to understand. Cause it's such a selfish, we're selfish human beings, addiction or not. That's just in, that's in us. We're wired yeah. like that. When we can step aside from that and leave 
leave like our personal opinions, leave, um, you know, our advice sometimes and just sit back and listen and encourage people, you know, where it could be a stranger too, man. Just, Oh man, that that's awesome. Yeah. man. have a, hope you have a great day. That's going to work out for you and really speak into people. That's one thing I still am learning, dude. And I'm, I feel, um, you feel so filled up when you do that. And like my sponsor always says, Oh, you're struggling with this. Well, get your ass out there and go help somebody. You know what I mean? Like, all right, cool. Right. I'll go help somebody. Yeah. That works, you know? Yeah. I just thought that was cool. And you really man. see people. Yeah. And you see people like th this example with my sister. I mean, I really notice a difference in them when you're communicating that way. Yeah. I mean, I won't go as far to say that you're going to help make that thing happen they're talking about. But I think you, you know, you're leaving the conversation. They're hanging up hopefully feeling a little better than they did when they told yep. you about it, you know? And, uh, I love that man, just offering positivity and just sometimes just shutting up and listening to the person, giving them your full attention. Such, yeah. such a simple thing, man, but how yeah. much of a difference that can make in your relationships with people. Yeah, that's good, man. That's good. Well, before we wrap up today, um, I, uh, let's see if, if folks want to check out no resolve, I put the link in here, no resolve info. It's at rich Beto on Instagram. Um, if you guys want to reach out or follow rich, um, any yeah. advice, uh, any, um, also too, I saw the, if, uh, if love, um, is it, if love was, was a gun, it? the teaser video yeah. came out yesterday, which is pretty funny, dude. I like the comedy elements of it, by the way. That yeah. Was sweet. Yeah. It's, yeah. uh, it's, it's really tongue in cheek. You know, the yeah. whole song is kind of that vibe. So yeah, it's, it's a fun one. That'll, I think that's coming out on Friday. Nice. Um, yeah, but any, anyone wants to reach out to me, uh, and you were saying uh, the advice thing, um, you know, I think it's all about songs man. you, you know, it's about the, the rock and roll world at least is still about getting on stage with good songs yeah. and, you know, and that's really, it doesn't always matter. You know, people these days have this big business plan with social media and I'm going to do this and I'm going to do this. It's all about followers. It's all about songs, man. It always has been, yeah, that's great. <laughs> um, and just going at it, man, remembering that touring and stuff is, is your job and you want to be the best that you can be. And I know in your twenties, it's easy, you know, it, the whole lifestyle, it's fun as well. And I had fun, man. I had lots of fun, but just, you want to be better than the next band that's right behind you. And there's always one right behind you, just waiting for, for you to fail, man. They're going to be popping right up. So, you know, just keeping that in mind. And uh, if anyone has any questions or anything they want to ask me about or get in touch with me, to me through facebook or instagram and i'll always answer you man and uh you know that's the beautiful thing about being sober man i look forward to talking to people and offering any help i can so please reach out yeah. to me man i'll get back to you that's good thanks a lot rich i appreciate it man good stuff thanks for coming on the podcast uh share the Thank podcast you, with a friend and uh you can check us out at that sober guy.com love you guys thanks for tuning in rich i'll see you in the next uh, meeting huh <laughs> yes sir man yeah. yes sir Absolutely. yeah good stuff dude good stuff well thanks for having me oh yeah yeah <laughs>